Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Welcome to the stream. I apologize for um, some of the confusion about timing. Um, a lot of that has to do with my mistake, um, and uh, so I accept responsibility for that. Um, um, thank you for joining us, though, regardless of the confusion. And um, uh, my name is Matthew. I'm one of the, um, the uh, online uh, course developers and uh, one of the instructors for our online classes. And we are super happy to have you with us today. This is going to be our last session before the Christmas holiday here in the US. Um, and uh, we've got some questions to get started with. But as you uh, join us, please feel free to post those in the chat. And we will grab them from the chat. We've got Vicky helping us out behind the scenes. Alexander's doing tech support, as always. And um, Chris, I will hand this over to you to welcome everyone. And then we'll get started with questions. OK, thanks, Matthew and Vicky. Um, welcome, everyone. Last last of the year. We'll be back in the new year, probably late in the first week of January. And um, I hope everyone caught the conjunction last night. At Tucson, it was perfectly clear and a beautiful sight. So the floor is open for your questions. Excellent. Uh, the first question is from one of our live participants. I'm not sure how to say it. Uh, Ahego Gao Senpai 987. Is dark matter truly dark or is it transparent? If it is indeed dark and abundant, shouldn't it block our view of the universe? So can we see through it? Could we hold it in our hands? Like what? what's, I mean, we don't know the nature of it, but what could it be like? Right, well, that's an interesting question. Um, is it transparent? Uh, no, I don't think so. So it totally depends on what dark matter is. The best, <clears throat> to cut to the chase, the, a lot of things have been ruled out and the best guess now is that it's a fundamental particle, uh, an extension of the standard model of particle physics. And so if dark matter is a fundamental particle, uh, these are extremely small particles. So the, even though dark matter is abundant, six times more abundant than normal matter in the universe, it tends to be thinly distributed. And since fundamental particles are so tiny, the, the answer to the question is no, it, it, it does not block light. So it's not it's not dark because it's opaque, but it's an interesting question. And it, and it is transparent in the sense that light can pass through the medium that contains dark matter because the dark matter particles are so tiny compared to the space between them. Basically, there's probably six or eight dark matter particles per cubic centimeter. And that sounds like a lot until you realize the cubic centimeter on a side is enough to contain uh, you know, trillions of atoms if you line them up side by side. So obviously, mostly empty space. Um, so no, dark matter does not have any sort of visual quality like that. It basically only exerts gravity. It doesn't interact with light at all. And it's part of why it's important to understand what dark matter is and isn't. Because it doesn't interact with the electromagnetic force, it doesn't reflect, scatter, or absorb radiation of any kind. Excellent, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Lawrence4401. Uh, do neutrinos travel at the speed of light? And uh, if so, do neutrinos have mass? It's Yes, it's a good question because the mass of a particle is related to its speed. Um, photons are essentially massless and travel at the speed of light. Neutrinos are, are hypothesized to be very low mass, and so they essentially travel at the speed of light. They may, in fact, travel at the speed of light. Um, the neutrino mass has not yet been measured directly. Uh, neutrinos oscillate between the three different flavors, and that leads to a sort of combined measure of mass, but not the individual mass of any flavor of neutrino. Uh, but the best guess is that they do indeed travel at or very close to the speed of light. All right, uh, the next question is from Keith Crum, um, who asks, uh, the peak conjunction was last night, but will still be pretty good tonight, right? So. Um, for places that where it wasn't clear last night, is it still worth going out and trying to view it? Yeah, absolutely. It's a good point. I mean, when we talk about the conjunction, it's the planets have been approaching each other for a week or so. Um, remember, these are very distant planets, a billion plus miles away, and they're moving 
fast in their orbits, but as seen from the Earth, they move relatively slowly on the sky from night to night. So any conjunction that's visible on one night is only going to change slightly the next night. Eventually, uh, when either or both of them get too close to the sun, then it'll just be hard to see because you can only see the conjunction at the moment within about an hour of sunset, just after the sun is set in the southwest sky. Uh, but yes, it'll be good to look for at for another few nights. Uh, the next question comes from Christina, who sent an email. Um, the Shoemaker-Levy 9 comet uh, was broken apart by Jupiter's tidal forces in 1992, but it took two years to reach and finally collide with Jupiter in 1994. Uh, why did it take so long, and why after two years was the impact, st the impact still so massive and uh, destructive instead of less? Well, Shoemaker-Levy, you know, had a long journey through the solar system and and had, you know, passing encounters with other objects. But it was, of course, this strong gravity of Jupiter that exerted a tidal force that ripped it apart. Uh, and in, in in terms of its orbital trajectory, it just took a while for that to happen and for it to be ripped up. And so it started to get uh, pulled apart by tidal forces long before it was actually going to hit Jupiter. And those fragments had separated into a number of chunks that people were able to follow with telescopes. And because the orbit was very well uh, plotted and very well calculated, astronomers could really accurately predict when these chunks were going to, the fragments, the debris of the comet were going to plow into the Jovian atmosphere. So it was an accurate prediction and everyone was ready to watch and the te big telescopes and the Hubble telescope pointed at it. Um, it's a very unusual event because this kind of thing obviously must happen from time to time, but we've never had a ringside seat for anything quite like this. Uh, the next question is from Megha Sharma, and I think generally people are interested in quantum entanglement. It seems strange and weird. Um, uh, and Megha would like to know, uh, what role does quantum entanglement play in the universe? That's not clear yet. Quantum entanglement is a phenomenon that can be now created pretty much at will in the physics laboratory, um, but we don't actually know if it operates in the universe. Um, quite particular conditions are required to set up quantum entanglement. Basically, the spin states of particles have to be aligned and controlled very carefully, for example, by using extremely low temperatures or aligning in a magnetic field. These are mechanisms that are used. And then you can create a coupled quantum state of one or more particles. Quantum entanglement has now been demonstrated in dozens of uh, particles at once. Those conditions are actually unlikely to arise naturally in astrophysics in the universe. So it's not clear that quantum entanglement plays any role in the sort of natural universe. All right, the next question is from Hernan Reyes, um, who is joining us from France and uh, sent an email. Um, he always has great questions about astrobiology and his uh, question today is about Enceladus. Seeing that it is such a tiny moon, how does one explain the hydrothermal vents at the bottom of its ocean that keep the salty water from freezing? Would such a tiny moon also have volcanic activity or is it all from uh, tidal heating from Saturn? Uh, that's a good question. So small worlds, small rocky bodies are not expected to either be geologically active or to be able to, for example, uh, hold liquid water within them if they're far from the sun, as Enceladus is. It's a moon of a Saturn, of course, so it's very far from the sun. Um, Enceladus is in a quite close and quite elliptical orbit of Saturn, and that combination of parameters for a, a moon is the it satisfies the requirement for tidal heating. So there's a strong degree of tidal heating in Enceladus, and that is completely sufficient to uh, essentially squeeze the rock over and over again each orbit and the succession of squeezings of the rock, physical squeezing of the me mechanical forces in the rock will of course heat up the material and anything that was interior ice can actually turn into interior liquid and then it will burst out through fissures in the rock and we see the icy geysers of Enceladus. So the geysers of Enceladus and its interior water inferred is, is strongly uh, coupled to tidal heating and is well explained by that. Um, it would have to be a lot more heating 
to generate volcanic activity. So the, the threshold for that would be, say, Io, small moon of Jupiter. So Io is also subject uh, to tidal heating. It's in an elliptical orbit, and it's a small moon quite close to its parent planet. Uh, and in that case, it's bigger. Io is substantially bigger than Enceladus. And so in this case, the heating, the tidal heating is enough not only uh, to create um, a liquid in the interior, in this case molten rock, but actually to have aquid, active volcanism. And in Io, the volcanoes are sulfur volcanoes that are spewing out. I think it's an amount of sulfur in a year that will cover coat Io with sulfur about two centimeters deep every year. It's quite impressive. All right, the next question is from Zalgbo. Uh, if human beings were living on the moon, what would be the effect of the low gravity on their health? How long can people live on the moon if they want to come back to the Earth without any health issues? It's not clear because, of course, humans, only 24 humans have been to the moon, only 12 have stepped on the surface, and the length of time was days. Um, and so we really don't know the long-term effects of low gravity, 1-6 gravity. We, of course, have experiments of astronauts in the space station, a record set by, I think, a Russian cosmonaut of over three years, uh, 1,100 days, something like that. Um, so we know that zero gravity for multiple years can have long-term health consequences, serious health consequences immediately, and then some long-term recovery issues. One six gravity is low enough that probably many of those issues seen with the astronauts in the space station would also occur for people in a lunar colony. That's just insufficient gravity for normal vascular systems and capillaries um, to work properly for it's low enough that muscles will probably atrophy. Uh, there will be changes in the fluid flow inside the head and the brain, which is actually some of the most dangerous symptoms of low gravity or zero gravity. So it is likely that the moon as a long-term habitat is going to have adverse health consequences to humans. And it's likely that a long-term colony, the colonists would not be able to stay there their entire natural lives or probably for more than a few years. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from one of our live participants. Alexander B. Uh, would like to know, uh, says, I watched a show about gravity on Earth, and there are satellites that record the gravity on both the Earth and the moon. Is there a difference in feeling with the gravity, with the different gravity levels on Earth? So, I mean, I guess, does it feel different? And um, what does it, what does the satellite feel that's different? Um, not all satellites are do gravitometric experiments, as these might be called. Um, it, it needs particular satellites that have suspended masses in them in some inertial situation. And so they're actually measuring the gravitational effect of the Earth as they're in orbit. Since they're above the Earth's surface, of course, the gravity they feel is less than the gravity you'd feel on the Earth's surface. And since their distance from the Earth and the center of the Earth where the gravity effectively operates is changing, they sense varying gravity. But really, the gravity in low Earth orbit, uh, which is just a few hundred kilometers up, is not that much different from the Earth's surface because you're still thousands of kilometers from the center of mass of the planet. So these are these are modest differences. These experiments are important because they try and use satellites that do this to map out uh, the gravity of the Earth, which is not uniform. Of course, the Earth is a spherical object whose density increases going to the center, but it's not completely uniform Uh, distributed, not only because of the plates that cause plate tectonics, but even interior regions of the Earth are not entirely uniform from one part of the sphere to another. All right. Uh, the next question <clears throat> is from an email from Jan Campos, who corrected me on the pronunciation of their name. So thank you very much for that. Um, according to the theory of inflation, the early universe expanded exponentially fast for a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. By what means were we able to pinpoint this time and the duration, and I mean, or how did we measure it? Well, it's a good question because it hasn't been measured. So the, the theory of inflation is a theory. It has some observational corroboration, but the corroboration does not really extend to measuring the beginning and the end of inflation in timed sense. The evidence for inflation is really evidence Uh, that explain that accounts for an exponential expansion early on 
which created essentially flat and smooth space time because that's what we see around us. The inference of the timing of inflation comes from the fact that it's associated with the unification of all the forces except gravity. Uh, and these unification of forces is known just by projection and extrapolation of physical forces to occur at something like 10 to the minus 33 to 10 to the minus 34 seconds after the Big Bang. If you trace the expansion backwards, that's when you are in the realm of unification. So it's a supposition of the theory that that's when inflation happened. But the actual starting and ending points of inflation are completely unknown. Um, how long inflation lasts affects how many exponential e-foldings of the universe there were, and so how many factors of 10 the universe grew during inflation. And we simply don't know that. We think it was a lot, like hundreds of e-foldings or thousands, but we don't know how many. So these estimates of the beginning and end of inflation are very generic, and they just are associated with grand unification theories and predictions, not with an actual measurement. The next question is from Wendy Traver, who sent an email. Last week, you discussed the changing views on string theory. I'm wondering what, in your opinion, would it take for string theory to become near universally accepted as the successor to the standard theory in terms of experimental proof? I think what would elevate string theory from its current status as a promising you know, uh, theory uh, with some tentative support, uh, string theory would have to do two things, one of which the theorists are doing, which is working through the theory to reproduce standard physics. Uh, it's a fundamentally different paradigm, if you like, for particles to hypothesize their tiny, microscopic, one-dimensional strings of mass energy. Um, so you have to be able to reproduce standard particle physics from string theory. And people have started to do that with some success. But of course, if you really want to believe string theory, you have to find some unique predictions of string theory that are not manifested by our standard and conventional physics. And those essentially rate, relate to the multiple dimensions of space. Uh, string theory in, typically involves 10 or 11 dimensional space-time manifolds. And so we need to have some evidence of these hidden space dimensions. And there are physics experiments underway, tabletop physics experiments even, you don't need large accelerators for this work, to try and see the effect of these hidden dimensions. Now, because those hidden dimensions really only truly manifest at extraordinarily high energies on very small scales, it's quite challenging to see the imprint of extra dimensions. So people have used, you know, very clever quantum scale techniques to try and tease out effects of these hidden dimensions. So far, these experiments have not succeeded, but some are actually quite promising. So I'd say the jury is out, but there are some, there are some avenues to try and get experimental support for string theory. Um, all right, uh, one of the next uh, questions from one of our live participants is, uh, speaking of humans in space, are there any scientific, experiment, scientific experiments happening on board the International Space Station that are either uh, past experiments that you found really interesting or upcoming experiments that are potentially interesting? That's a good question, because the space station is doing experiments all the time, small scale lab experiments. And I'm only ever aware of some of them that are interesting to me that are maybe physics type experiments. A lot of what they do on the space station is biological experiments. They look at uh, simple organisms, microbial organisms, to see how they develop under zero gravity. Uh, they look at larger creatures, plants, and sometimes animals to see how they behave under zero gravity. And they do uh, chemical experiments, which are precursors of the kind of experiments pharmaceutical companies want to do to, to generate uh, drugs in space by novel techniques that employ the fact of zero gravity. Uh, so I'm not aware of any exciting experiments recently. And the truth is, you know, just to be totally honest, the scientific experiments conducted on the space station in its entire history have not been dramatic or foundational or game-changing in any field of science that I'm aware of. It's not really what it's there for, to be honest. It's not viewed as a scientific research station of any incredible merit that would warrant the vast expenditure. It's really more a demonstration of how we can live and work in space. And in that regard, it's been pretty successful. Uh, the next question is from one of our live participants. Um, does time run differently on other planets, such as Mars? 
um, considering <clears throat> um, you know the the length of its cycles and gravitational effects. So there are two parts of an answer to that question: time running differently on Mars or any other planet, for example. Um, the physical fundamental nature of time does depend on the situation of gravity. That's a consequence of general relativity. So clocks run slower in strong gravitational fields. Uh, we can measure this on the Earth's surface. So we've shown that clocks run slightly slower on the Earth's surface than they do in Earth orbit or in deep space as an effect of general relativity, but it's a tiny effect. And the same will be true of Mars. Mars is less massive, so clocks on Mars will run uh, slower than they do in deep space, but not quite as slow as they do on the Earth. So that's a general relativity effect that we can predict and maybe eventually measure. The other aspect is more mundane. It's just timekeeping. It's just how would you keep time on a planet that's not the Earth? On the Earth, you keep time, of course, by the diurnal cycle of the Earth's spin, 24-hour um, clock. And on Mars, you uh, keep different time. So Mars time is, the Mars day is slightly longer, about an hour longer, and so the Martian day is longer, and I presume colonists living there would keep their body clocks aligned to the Martian cycle of the sun rising and setting, a slightly longer day. And so in other astrophysical environments, humans, if they're connected to the, the sun in any way, will still tend to follow the sunlight. And now, in some situations, that may not be much of a variation at all. Imagine living in a polar or a polar region or the Arctic or the Antarctic. You can have whole times of the year, months at a time, when the sun fairly changes its angle in the sky and there's eternal darkness or eternal light. And so you'd have to use artificial timekeeping to regulate your affairs. And that may be true on planets as well. And then just to throw in, um, the Mars mission, the Mars-Phoenix mission that was here on Earth, um, it was run from here on Earth, sorry, and the, the lander was on, on Mars. I had several friends who actually lived Martian days. And so they, mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I think you mentioned this, they call them souls. Right. And, um, and they have actually did research on how it affected humans living on that schedule. And uh, so I thought that yeah. was kind of interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a, like a, a separate question and answer, you know, how do people who deal with a different time cycle handle it? And and for the Martian rovers, of which we've had a number now, the Spirit and Opportunity were the longest lived, um, and we have another rover there now, um, Curiosity. Yeah, they those people running uh, those missions, they're stuck on the Earth, but they have to essentially keep Mars time, and that can be quite disruptive. Um, the next question is from Drew1618. Is it more probable that we will finally observe Hawking radiation at a stellar mass black hole, supermassive black hole, or a tiny man-made black hole via collision here on Earth? Um, or won't that we won't we see it in a small uh, black hole? I on Earth? think the truth is that observing Hawking radiation is is very challenging, and I even might say beyond the pale of experimental method for the foreseeable future. So. The radiation, the amount of radiation and the evaporation rate does depend on mass, and the Hawking radiation of a stellar mass black hole gives it an equivalent temperature, an effective temperature of, I think, a few billionths of a Kelvin. Uh, that's an incredibly low temperature, far beyond anything we can measure on Earth in, an, in any sort of messy astrophysical setting. It's not a clean lab experiment, of course. We can create temperatures like that on the Earth, actually. Uh, we just can't measure them outside beyond the Earth. Um, the supermassive black holes, in principle, uh, their Hawking radiation is greater because they're more massive, the temperature is slightly larger, um, but they're in even more messy situations because supermassive black holes are in the center of galaxies, there's a lot of gas and dust, and they're shrouded regions, and they're very far away. So for, again, purely practical reasons, the odds of seeing Hawking radiation in a region that's full of radiation from stars and active star formation and accretion disk around the supermassive black hole and plasma jets, uh, it's just going to be lost, totally lost in the noise of that kind of astrophysical activity. So I think, unfortunately, it doesn't matter what the mass of the black hole is, it's going to be hard to detect. And as for smaller black holes that we might hypothetically create, well, I think if we ever had the technology to create microscopic black holes, yes, we probably would have the technology to see the Hawking radiation. And they, of course, evaporate quite quickly. But we're also, 
extremely far from that capability. The next question is from Ankita Kumari, uh, who sent an email. Is there a chance that the distant moons of the ice giants can support life? And if we need to study any moon, uh, its atmosphere, whether or not life could possibly exist, um, uh, what kind of equipment would we need to do that uh, kind of experiment, either here from here on Earth or to send to the moon? Yeah, the best guess from planetary scientists is that there are 10 or 12, about a dozen outer solar system moons that have the ingredients for life. It's a simple statement. That means that these are moons that are obviously quite large, so they have uh, a combination of geological heating from the mass of their rock and tidal heating from their parent planet. So they have an internal heat source because they're very far from the sun. So solar radiation is not going to create habitable conditions. The habitable conditions only can exist in the interior, therefore. Uh, the other two ingredients they need are a source of carbon, and there's carbon-rich material in most rocky bodies in the solar system, and then, of course, liquid water. So they have free energy. They can keep liquid water in the interior uh, under the pressure of a rocky, icy cap because these moons don't have atmospheres except for Titan. They have slender or absent atmospheres. So in that sense, that's a, a lot of ha promising habitable worlds in the outer solar system. Uh, Ganymede is a great example to talk about. It's the largest moon in the solar system, and it almost certainly has liquid oceans under its surface. And so, again, could be habitable there. How can we go beyond the speculation and the to the experimentation? Well, it's a matter of decades-long planning and missions. We have an Europa icy clipper. We have a a Europa mission that's planned, and Europa is a very promising water world in the uh, in the outer solar system, moon of Jupiter. Um, but going back to Titan and Enceladus would be very exciting, and visiting Ganymede is also exciting. And then Uranus and Neptune have a few of these uh, possible habitable moons, and they're just so far away that that's a, a large planning exercise. So telescopes cannot help us very much because these bodies are small and they're pretty far away. So resolution of telescopes on the Earth or even the Hubble Space Telescope or James Webb, just not going to tell us that much more. We have to visit with space probes. And at the moment, the free energy in the NASA budget is only about a billion dollars a year for a new thing that you can ramp up. Uh, and, and there's a lot of competition for those new things. And, and there's competition between outer solar system and Mars and solar missions and so on. Um, so we're not creating new missions that are going to look at these potentially habitable worlds at nearly the rate most astrobiologists would like. That's unfortunate. It's just a limited resource issue. So we talked earlier a little bit about dark matter. Um, Toucan Ruler would like to know how is dark energy detected and how do you measure it? Dark energy is only measured indirectly. It's measured and inferred. Its existence is inferred by the accelerating expansion of the universe. That was first observed in 1995 using uh, supernovae as markers of space and time and standard candles, if you like, or standard light bulbs to measure the distance to distant galaxies. And looking at those distances at different uh, redshifts or look back times, it was possible to show that the universe went through a deceleration phase and then about five billion years ago started to accelerate. So dark energy is just the name given to the phenomenon of the vacuum of space that causes this acceleration. And that's almost all we know about dark energy. We also know through observation that it doesn't seem to vary in either distance or location in the universe or over cosmic time which means it has the attributes of Einstein's uh, famous cosmological constant in his solution to general relativity. Uh, but that's not really much to go on. Uh, there's no other physical uh, clue as to what dark energy might be. And physics fails badly in trying to understand any property of the vacuum that would lead the universe to accelerate in its expansion. So this is probably the biggest cipher in modern astrophysics, the nature of dark energy. Uh, the next question is from uh, Turboplop, Turboprop Slayer, Turbop Slayer, <laughs> who's on with us live. NASA is honing plans for its Mars, Mars Ice Mapper mission. Do you know anything about the mission? And can you, if so, can you talk a little bit about what it is and what they're looking for? I don't know a lot about this particular mission, but Mars is uh, of interest because there are now sort of conflicting data sets on how much uh, subsurface ice there is 
uh, on Mars. So different missions over the last 15 years have given us slightly different answers on the inventory of subsurface ice and potentially water on Mars. And so I think this ice mapper is just going to do the job with radar, with reflectance techniques, and at much higher resolution and over a longer period of time than any other mission. So it hopefully will return a definitive answer. Based on the data of previous orbiters, there was the inference that the mid-latitudes of Mars have extensive glaciers under the surface, not and, and extending quite close to the surface where the ice becomes mixed with rock. And the in, but the inventory of water, uh, the equivalent amount of water of these glaciers has been controversial. Uh, one estimate, again, seven or eight years ago, said that there was enough water in these frozen glaciers mid-latitude if, if it was all melted, it would produce a body of water around the whole of Mars about four centimeters thick. It's not that much water, but it's quite impressive. So these new missions are going to get a better answer, a more definitive answer, and probably also give interesting information on the depth to which these glaciers extend, because doing the inventory of water on a planet means you actually have to go quite deep. Glaciers can extend not just hundreds of meters, but several kilometers deep. All right, uh, the next couple of comments and questions are from Asha B21, who's on with us live. And um, I think uh, we, first we can start by sort of um, correcting maybe a misconception um, about uh, the requirements for a simple theory of how the universe works. Um, but they ask, why would we put so much effort into string theory when we know the universe must be explained simply? Not that it necessarily must. Um, it seems like string theory is so complex that it can't be true. Why this desire to confuse simple things instead of trying to find out the basic algorithms of the universe? Well, it's a good, what's behind the question is a, is a good thought, an interesting thought. And it's the idea of what is the best theory if you don't know amongst a set of theories. There's a principle in the methodology of science called Occam's Razor, named after William of Occam, a British nobleman hundred, living hundreds of years ago. Occam's razor says, all things being equal, the simplest theory is best. That's, you know, that's in modern language. I'm sure he expressed it in a more eloquent way back then. Um, that's a premise that we don't know is supported by the world we live in. It's not always obvious that the simplest theory is the best. Maybe theories are complex. Maybe we're not smart enough to understand the true complexity of the universe. String theory is simple, it's complex in its mathematics, it's complex in positing extra dimensions, that seems a little unnecessary, but in its essence, it actually is a very simple theory. It's based on simple and quite elegant ma ma mathematics of multidimensional space times, and it posits that the entire spectrum of different fundamental particles are really examples of the same one-dimensional string-like entities, and that all the phenomena of particles are just the vibrations, oscillations, interactions of those one-dimensional strings. So in that sense, it simplifies particle physics quite a lot, at the expense of a theoretical apparatus and mathematical apparatus that, that seems a little complicated. So does that make string theory a good explanation for how the universe is? Maybe, maybe not. We're not driven to need string theory in our understanding of the universe. The Big Bang model uh, explains an awful lot of what we see, but it runs into a limit in the very early universe with the hypothetical singularity of the beginning of the universe at infinite density and temperature. So to avoid that singularity issue, again, you have to reach for new physics, and string theory is one example of the new physics. So I would say uh, scientists are gen tend to be agnostic about whether the best theories have to be simple. Despite Occam's razor, it's not obvious that that needs to be the case. And kind of a follow-up related question is, um, what is the motivation for having a clear theory of everything? Once we have a complete answer, what then? And how would knowing uh, everything change it, uh, change us? Right. Um, I mean, it's it's been the agenda of physics for the last century to have fundamental and profound theories that explain everything, essentially, theory of everything. Um, we know that the past uh, 30 or 40 years have taught us that there are theories that unite different forces of nature. The electromagnetic and weak forces 
are were unified in theoretical terms and then observed in that demonstration in CERN in the 1970s. And the next day, it's a grand unified theories that bring the strong nuclear force into play. Are, there's a lot of interest in that because we've already had success unifying two of the three, four, two of the four forces. Bringing the third into the table would be another advantage. Uh, unifying the phenomena, the leap of putting gravity into the equation, and all four forces, a theory of everything. That's very ambitious, and people have failed to do that successfully for decades. It may not be possible. It's not clear that we have the capability to come up with such a theory. The benefit of the theory is that it could be the end of the road of theorizing. If you produce a theory that's simple and elegant and has a mathematical framework that you can understand and, and, and derive results from, then in principle, if not in practice, you can derive the phenomena of the universe from first principles. That's a very powerful thing to be able to do. Now, the universe in detail is always going to be so complex uh, that you can't derive all the details from any physical theory. The universe is not completely deterministic, for example. But just having the theory of everything will mean that the theorizing about the nature of reality, physical reality, will have reached its end game. All right, uh, the next question is from a couple of people. We received an email about it, and also someone mentioned it in the chat. And I saw an article from Seth Shostak about this. Apparently, there was um, recently a signal, some kind of radio signal, uh, possibly from Proxima Centauri B, uh, received by the Parks Radio Observatory in Australia, um, and recently was leaked to the UK Guardian newspaper. Um, and it's as yet unexplained. Um, and uh, what what is your opinion on this? Do you know anything uh, more recent about it? And and then let's talk about the process of determining how you know how how would we determine if it is extraterrestrial or not? Right. I, I'm going to pass on the park signal itself because I saw a, just a, a short media blurb and it didn't have enough scientific meat on it for me to talk about it sensibly. Uh, but I will defer to Seth Shostak, who's a very senior scientist, the, the senior scientist at the SETI Institute, and, and his opinion on this signal would be as good as any scientist's as to whether it's a, even a hypothetical alien communication. I mean, Seth is in the game of looking for intelligent life in the universe by the artificial signals, but he's also a good scientist and a skeptic. So um, if he thinks it's an interesting signal, then it very probably is. So the process of verification is, is the same as it would be in most scientific fields. It involves, uh, verification means repetition, right? So unfortunately in science, if you have a singular phenomena, one, pheno one signal that never repeats, you can't make a claim about that. It's just simply not possible. You need repeatable, verifiable uh, phenomena to be able to talk about it. That's a problem, of course, with most UFO sightings that they're they're not they don't repeat almost by definition, and they're also anecdotal. Uh, there have been a couple of signals. The Wow signal of 1977, I think, at the Ohio Radio Telescope, uh, and a few other signals by the radio telescopes looking for intelligent signals from aliens. But they have not repeated, and so people just have to move on. It's not really going to be a phenomenon that will get major attention from scientists unless it can be studied uh, in detail by a large number of scientists, not just the ones at one observatory. Excellent. And, <clears throat> and Seth's response was very, very similar, that <clears throat> we shouldn't ignore the signal, but that it's a little too early to tell. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Student McLeod uh, says in the January Astronomy Magazine issue, it says that photons were released to travel the small universe when electrons joined nuclei forming neutral atoms. And this is why WMAP can photograph the cosmic microwave background. But then it says that neutral atoms kept photons from traveling the universe leading to the dark age. It seems like those facts conflict with one another. Do neutral atoms allow or stop photons from traveling through the universe? So the, the event that you're asking, the question is asking about is called recombination. Um, and it's, there's a related physical effect called decoupling. So the epoch of recombination corresponds to a time um, about 400,000 years after the Big Bang when the universe had cooled enough to be a temperature of about 3,000 Kelvin. 
And at that temperature, the density and temperature were sufficient for the universe to stop being a plasma of mostly hydrogen and then some helium. And what that means is that um, electrons combine with protons to form neutral hydrogen atoms. Now, what dramatic thing happens then is that uh, most photons before that time are scattering off electrons. The dominant scattering process for photons is electron scattering. And it's that electron scattering from the free electrons in the plasma that means that light can't travel in straight lines, the universe is opaque, it's like you're looking back into the fog of the early universe. As soon as the electrons all join together with the protons and form a stable, small unit, the free electrons are not available to scatter photons and the photons travel freely. So the universe becomes transparent and photons travel freely. Now, at that point, the neutral atoms uh, don't have anything particularly to do with the photons because the photons are traveling freely in a transparent universe. But over a subsequent period of time, like 50 to 100 million years, gravity is grabbing those neutral atoms from the intergalactic medium and forming density concentrations, which eventually collapse into stars and then galaxies. And so the period of time that it takes for that to happen is called the dark ages. And it's dark because the photons are still there, uh, being redshifted by the expansion now to become uh, far infrared radiation. Uh, and matter itself has not started to glow by fusion of stars and galaxies containing stars. So that's the dark ages. It's not really anything to do with the transparency of the universe. It's due to the time it has to be for gravity to form structures that can generate light of their own by fusion. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from one of our live participants. In 2029, there was an asteroid that was supposed to come close to hitting the Earth. Now it is supposed to come between the Earth and the Moon. Can this asteroid get pulled towards the Earth by our own gravity, or would it be going too fast? Um, yes, the new trajectory has it not hitting either object, the Earth or the Moon. And, and in yes, the, tr the tens of thousands of miles per hour speed of an asteroid, uh, and it's distance from either object, because it's not going to be super close to either one, mean that its deflection or odds of uh, being altered in its trajectory are quite low. So it essentially will pass harmlessly between the Earth and the Moon. Um, how is it that um, astronomers are able to figure out the paths of these um, objects so accurately and take into account um, things like gravitational passes and assists and things like that. So studying the motions of small objects in the solar system, uh, you know, requires an enormous amount of computation. And this really wasn't very easy to do until the last decade when laptop or desktop computers became as powerful as supercomputers used to be a decade before. But that's what it requires. So it requires two things. It requires monitoring of the trajectories, the orbital elements of these objects through telescopes, careful astrometry or positional measurement from night to night to night. Um, and now we have deep sky networks and robotic networks of telescopes that are of order of meter size. So there's copious data on near Earth objects and asteroids in the asteroid belt and anything that comes close to the Earth. So there's very high quality data on how they move through space obtained over months and years. And then that feeds into a computer, a supercomputer, which is calculating the orbital elements based on the data from telescopes, and then taking into account the gravity of other objects in the three-dimensional space, like planets or moons. And all that takes a lot of computation, but it can be done very accurately now, uh, because the data going in is very good and extensive, didn't used to be, and because the computers are very powerful, they didn't used to be either. So this is a very mature field, and so there's a very high degree of confidence we can have in projecting the trajectory of a near-Earth object into the future. Um, and that's how even objects that seem to be potentially dangerous because they're in Earth-crossing orbits, that's a very general statement, crossing the orbit of the Earth, not its exact orbit, but in the vicinity of the Earth. When you do the detailed calculations, you gain a very high degree of confidence that although it's a near-Earth object, it won't actually hit the Earth. That's it's almost always been the case. Um, so the setup for this question <clears throat> is a little long, so I will try and condense it a bit. Um, but uh, basically, uh, single-coded uh, notes that um, we 
have found potential Earth-like planets around red dwarfs, which suggests that there could be um, places where the conditions exist for life for very, very, very long periods of time. So there could be ancient, ancient civilizations. Um, and the question is really about uh, how are humans dealing with the hypothesis of our own extinction? Um, you know, since uh, potential civilizations in the universe might exist so far apart, are we thinking about saving anything from ourselves or saving ourselves um, to try and, uh, you know, save something about our culture with, you know, such a short-lived mm -hmm. star and planet as we have? So I'll, I'll sort of treat this as two separate questions because because they really are. I mean, one is the question of the Earth habitability or Earth-like planets around red dwarf stars. That's an important topic because uh, dwarf stars, red dwarfs, outnumber sun-like stars by a factor of hundreds. So there are many more potentially habitable planets around red dwarfs than there are around solar-type stars. And we've started to do the work of detecting planets around red dwarfs measuring their masses or sizes, uh, and finding Earth-like planets. As far as habitability and life, though, uh, red dwarfs have some complicating features. Some red dwarfs actually have high degrees of chromospheric and coronal activity, and so they emit a lot of x-rays. And they can be uh, sort of poor environments for life, if you like, unless the life is protected by a magnetic field, as, as our planet is, and a thick atmosphere. The second feature is that uh, to be habitable, of course, an Earth-like planet around a red dwarf has to be much closer to the star than the Earth is to the sun, and often close enough that the planet is tidally locked, which is to say that the differential gravity of the dwarf star on the planet essentially tugs on the front surface and keeps it always aligned to the star. And so these habitable planets, potentially habitable planets, might not have an Earth uh, a regular daily cycle of heat and darkness, of darkness and light and heat and cold. And that means these conditions might be a little extreme on those planets. Perhaps if there's a thick atmosphere, the atmosphere will act to smooth out these temperature variations and create more equitable regions or a, a sort of a limb zone where the temperature is intermediate, but we don't know. So there's some un very big uncertainties as to how actually habitable Earth-like planets around red dwarfs are. As far as the second question of what the knowledge of other habitable locations in the universe has on our longevity or our, uh, our fate as a living civilization on an Earth-like planet, um, well, it would be nice to imagine that we could endure forever. I, I don't actually think we need to find a place to go to or a plan B in the sense of Earth-like planet elsewhere. The distance and the difficulty of getting there would just be phenomenal. In a sense, we are better off using our technology to uh, deal with our situation here. So I presume we're going to immunize ourselves from the need for a star if our, we advance our technology more than a few more centuries. And at that point, uh, humans could live anywhere. I mean, literally anywhere. They don't have to live on a planet. We could be living in habitats in space that we build that are self-sustaining, that generate their own energy, uh, and are, are literally self-contained. They could make artificial gravity, too, if that was necessary. So I think long before the sun extinguishes, uh, which is four or five billion years away, uh, humans, if we persist, will have the technology to endure and survive and adapt and, and create our own living circumstance. So we won't actually need to worry about finding another habitable home to go to. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Newtopia uh, asks, what needs to happen to protect, protect uh, the Earth's low orbit from helter-skelter space satellites. Uh, is a global governance system required? Yes, this is a, this is a big issue. I was, on a, I was at a conference, a virtual conference, just a couple of weeks ago called MILSATCOM, Military Satellite Conference. And I was on a panel dealing with space debris. Uh, so the military and the governments who put up military satellites, spy satellites, they're worried about this. The civilian sector is worried about it. NASA is worried about it. Everyone who puts up satellites uh, is worried about it. The big uh, injection of space debris is now coming from telecommunications industry. Uh, SpaceX is in the process of putting up constellations of satellites that in the end will number over 40,000. Um, 
you know, multiplying by a factor of several the total number of satellites in low Earth orbit. Now, they're small satellites, and they're designed eventually to burn up naturally in the Earth's atmosphere, so planned obsolescence. But the truth is that uh, some of them will stay up for a long time, and collisions of these satellites creates a huge amount of shrapnel or debris. And these debris particles, even when they're only a centimeter in size, traveling at tens of thousands of miles an hour, can punch a hole, for example, through the space station, a catastrophic breach of the space station, or destroy another satellite. This problem is getting worse over time, and so, yes, to answer the question of what's being done about it, the answer is not yet much, but it's like everyone's attention is now focused on it. Um, and there are various strategies to try and mitigate against space debris. They involve uh, space tugs to pull down the big satellites to make sure they do orbit, um, magnetic uh, sweeping mechanisms, um, attaching rockets or retros to other satellites to deorbit them. Um, there, there's a whole set of mechanisms, but they're not very efficient because space is big. Even low Earth orbit is a big amount of real estate. And with tens of thousands of satellites and millions of pieces of debris that can cause havoc, uh, this is a problem that's only gonna get worse before it gets better. Um, the next question is from Zolglo. I've read, um, Sorry, I've read a short article about uh, the possibility that time is only an illusion. What do you think about this statement? Um, is it worth reading more about it? Uh, would it be possible to recreate physics without time? Yeah, the nature of time is still a matter of interesting physical and philosophical investigation. I don't know that I would say time is an illusion. The perception of time as experienced by humans or maybe other animals it has a psychological component, and we all know about that. Uh, the perception of time's arrow, the fact that the events move forward and never backward, is definitely an unusual phenomena and may be associated with our perception and the psychology of our awareness of time. The physics t sense of time is a little more interesting because microscopic physics has a very weak sense of time in the sense that almost all fundamental particle interactions can go equally well forward or backward in time. There's a very, very mild time asymmetry in fundamental physics, but it is very mild. Time is more symmetric than not in fundamental physics. So in that sense, uh, the physical nature of time is quite different from the psychological nature of time. And we can try and reconcile these things through laws of thermodynamics and the idea of entropy increasing, but that doesn't fully account for all the phenomena of time, I think. Time retains some mysteries. Uh, the next question is from Mile High AP. Would you personally like to see Arecibo rebuilt, or do you think a totally new telescope in order? Or the third option is, should we build nothing in its place? It's a, it's a sad event. Uh, Arecibo um, fell down, was destroyed essentially by a catastrophic collapse. I have used it a number of times, not recently, but in the past. It's a spectacular facility. Um, it's, it's hard to know how to approach this. Arecibo was built where it was for natural reasons. It's a, it's a natural indentation in karst or limestone formations in Puerto Rico. That, that naturally forms a bowl shape. So it was relatively little amount of rock and earth that had to be moved to fit a, a shell, a concentric sh part of a sphere of dish in that region. So in a sense, you could say that reconstructing it would be easier because you already have a lot of infrastructure there. You already have buildings, places for people to stay, engineering, power, etc. And if you just cleared away the debris and rebuilt it, why not? Um, so that is not a bad idea. Meanwhile, of course, it should be remembered that Arecibo was already surpassed a few years ago by the uh, FAST, F-A-S-T is the acronym, the Chinese radio telescope, in, also in limestone karst country in south of China. And that's 500 meters across, so bigger than Arecibo, which is 305 meters. So Arecibo had already been eclipsed by a Chinese facility. Uh, and I think the world could still use another large radio telescope like that for pulsar work, for the SETI work, for all the things that it has been doing, studying galaxies and their hydrogen. Um, but uh, the money is simply not there. Remember, the money wasn't there to keep Arecibo running as it was. It was sort of, it was uh, orphaned by, from federal funding, handed off between different universities to be caretakers. And there were already 
intimations that it would be shut down for financial reasons even before it collapsed. So it's a question whether actually there are resources in the American astronomical budgets to rebuild it at all. Uh, and there are, meanwhile, other priorities that astronomers have. It's not clear that rebuilding Arecibo would elevate into the top tier of priorities when the astronomers gather for their decadal survey to look at the priorities for things they want to build in the next 10 years. Uh, the next question um, is from one of our live participants. A popular theory of galaxy formation suggests that small galaxies merge to form larger ones. But there was a galaxy 12 billion light years from Earth that apparently formed itself from gas in the early universe via exceedingly rapid star formation. Uh, are you familiar with this? And can you uh, talk about uh, the, these possibilities? Right. The general theory of galaxy formation is a hierarchical theory, a top-down theory, where the small objects, and there's well understood gravitational physics of the early universe to account for this based on the nature of dark matter, that you will tend to form small structures first, and those small structures will aggregate into bigger galaxies. And so you generally will form dwarf galaxies first, then they will interact and merge to form larger galaxies. We know this happens because we can see it through the history of the universe, and we can even see in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, that it's in the process of ingesting a couple of dwarf galaxies and has recently ingested dwarf galaxies. So we know this hierarchical structure formation happens. But that doesn't preclude rapid formation of a large galaxy. It just actually says that that might be rare. Elliptical galaxies seem to be the kind of galaxies that could form instantaneously from one large cloud gravitationally collapsing and the stars switching on all at once, which is also now seen to be happening at large distances from the Earth. So there will be some galaxies that form from large clouds spontaneously Gravita gravitationally collapsing in free fall, but they should be outnumbered. They should be rare objects, and they should be outnumbered by the dwarf galaxies at high redshifts or large distances that merge into bigger galaxies. All right, uh, it's now 10.58, so we're at the end of our time for today. So we'll wrap up with one final question, um, which is from Jean-Pierre, who sent an email. Um, and it boils down to, um, we think that the most likely cause of the extinction of the massive extinction of the dinosaurs was a meteorite. Um, but why is it that we don't think that it could, uh, couldn't have been, have been caused by a simpler explanation like a virus, for example, more deadly than the COVID-19 virus uh, you know, pandemic we're facing today? Right. Well, to update the story, the simple story of a uh, giant impact causing the d extinction of the dinosaurs at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary 65 million years ago, that story has been substantially complicated by the likelihood that the dinosaurs died due to a one-two punch. The other part of the uh, devastation was caused by volcanism. So there are uh, large areas of Asia that were essentially terraformed with lava fields, huge lava fields, um, you know, large fraction of the size of the continental US in a relatively short period of time. And that amount of volcanism in a short period of time, of course, uh, releases enormous amount of carbon dioxide, uh, causes a, a short term greenhouse effect, and also a lot of uh, toxic gases are released as well. So this volcanism episode was coupled with an asteroid impact um, to kill a large fraction of species, about a third of all large species. Um, how do we know that it wasn't something more like a pandemic? That's an interesting question. I think the only reason we don't think it was a pandemic is uh, we don't have any sense of pathogens that could uh, decimate an entire, you know, what amounts to an entire fraction of a biosphere at that level. Because if you're talking about all the different forms of life that are in the oceans, uh, we're talking about mammals, we're talking about plants, we're talking about uh, chordates, things with backbones and things without backbones, or things as different as jellyfish and uh, elephants, say, well, not in the distant past. Um, we don't know of any pathogens that can operate across the animal and plant kingdom like that. Uh, and so it seems very unlikely that any single pathogen, even one in the distant past, 
would have taken out life in a wholesale fashion like that because biology tends to be specific to the organism at some level uh, as we for instance see in our own pathogens and pandemics of the present era even though some of these pathogens and and uh, viruses spread from animals to humans they're zoonotic as they're called um, it's very unusual in fact it's never seen that any of these viral agents will infect a large spectrum of the animal kingdom so that's why we don't think a pandemic took out the dinosaurs but interesting question to ask at the end so thanks for your good questions as always uh, thanks to vicky and matthew for facilitating and i uh, wish you all a good end of 2020 and we're all hoping 2021 is a brighter year than this past one thank you and goodbye Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Um, if you have a chance to check out the subscribe instructions and would be interested in subscribing to the channel, please do that. Uh, otherwise, we will send out a schedule for the next um, live sessions, um, and they will all be happening, you know, in the in the new year. I, I'm I'm assuming. So we'll send that out as soon as we know. Thanks. Take care. <laughs>